Dear students, now let me discuss a very important topic in the respiratory system that is respiratory failure. Now remember an important point here based on the pathophysiological mechanisms that will lead to respiratory failure. Respiratory failure is classified into four types, right? We have type 1, type 2, type 3 and as well as type 4 respiratory failure. Now. So let me take up the discussion from type 1 respiratory failure and you see how the question can be framed on type 1 respiratory failure. So the question is, the false statement about type 1 respiratory failure is, the options are decreased partial pressure of oxygen, decreased partial pressure of carbon dioxide, normal partial pressure of carbon dioxide and normal AA gradient, right? So these are all the options. Now, what I will do is I will discuss in detail about the type 1 respiratory failure and then we will come back to this particular question. Now, you see, type 1 respiratory failure, the another name which is given for this particular type 1 respiratory failure, this is also called as, right, this is also called as acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Right, this is also called as acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Now, what exactly this means is, remember in these patients with the acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, there is, the individual is having hypoxia where there is decrease in the concentration of oxygen in these patients. Right, it is also called acute hypoxemic failure. So, what is happening in these individuals? There is decrease in the oxygen levels in the body. Now, now the question comes, why there is decrease in the oxygen levels? What are the pathophysiological mechanisms, reason why the individual is suffering from hypoxia? Remember, the reason why the individual is having hypoxemia is mainly because of the alveolar flooding. Right, it is mainly because of the alveolar flooding and not only because of the alveolar flooding, the other reason why these individuals will have hypoxemia is because of, right, is because of subsequent intrapulmonary shunt, right, subsequent intrapulmonary shunt. So, because of these two reasons, the individual will have the hypoxemia. Now, now the question comes, what are all the various reasons why or where the individual can have the hypoxemia? Sorry, alveolar flooding. Now, if you take the reasons for the alveolar flooding, this alveolar flooding is mainly because of, number one, it could be because of the pulmonary edema, right? It could be because of the pulmonary edema or this alveolar flooding can be because of pneumonia, right, or this alveolar flooding could be because of the alveolar hemorrhage. Now, based on this pathophysiology, let me discuss what are all the various etiologies which will be causing the type 1 respiratory failure. See, the basic pathophysiology in case of type 1 respiratory failure is the hyperventilation. So, there is hyperventilation, right? So, because of hyperventilation, now why do you think that the individual has developed hyperventilation here? Now, because of the alveolar flooding or because of subsequent intrapulmonary shunt, the individual is landing up in hypoxia. So, once there is an hypoxia, the chemoreceptors, they get stimulated. So, once the chemoreceptors are stimulated, they will send the impulse to the respiratory centers and those respiratory centers will send the signals back to the respiratory muscles and thereby the respiratory rate increases, right? Thereby the respiratory rate increases and once the individual is having hyperventilation, there will be carbon dioxide washout. So, what you will have in patients with the type 1 respiratory failure is, right? What you will have in patients with type 1 respiratory failure is, there will be hypoxemia, and as well as either there will be decrease in the carbon dioxide 
or there will be normal carbon dioxide levels right either there will be decrease in the carbon dioxide or normal carbon dioxide levels in these patients with the type 1 respiratory failure now what i will do is i'll tell you the etiologies where you will come across the type 1 respiratory failure so basic pathology what is happening that is alveolar flooding and as well as subsequent intrapulmonary shunt now let me combine all these two conditions and let me tell you what are all the clinical conditions where you have alveolar flooding and as well as subsequent intrapulmonary shunt and that will be the etiologies where you will have the type 1 respiratory failure so now let me tell you what are all the clinical conditions where you have the type 1 respiratory failure number 1 see which is the condition where you have the pulmonary edema and that to a non cardiogenic pulmonary edema so you come across this in case of ARDS that is acute respiratory distress syndrome you have this particular alveolar flooding or alveolar edema next the other clinical condition where they can have this particular alveolar edema or where there can be subsequent intrapulmonary shunt is in case of fat embolism syndrome right in case of the fat embolism syndrome next you take the other clinical condition that is acute asthma right because in case of acute asthma what is happening there is bronchoconstriction because of bronchoconstriction there is no adequate passage of the air and due to which the individual will end up in hypoxia and because of hypoxia they will have hyperventilation due to which they will have carbon dioxide washout all right next the other etiology if you see here you can see in case of pneumonia pneumonia already i have discussed the individual will have the alveolar flooding next so the other etiology is the spontaneous pneumothorax so these are all the etiologies where you come across the type 1 respiratory failure now the treatment all together i'll discuss at the end of the type 4 respiratory failure but now, for now remember these are all the etiologies and these are, this is the basic pathophysiology what is happening in your type 1 respiratory failure next next we'll move on to the discussion of the type 2 respiratory failure right let move on to the discussion of type 2 respiratory failure now if you take type 2 respiratory failure the basic pathophysiology in type 2 respiratory failure is hypoventilation right hypoventilation now what are the reasons for the hypoventilation i will tell you but because of the hypoventilation the individual will land up in type 2 respiratory failure so because there is hypoventilation the oxygen levels will be reduced and the carbon dioxide will not be eliminated out so the carbon dioxide will retain in the body and that will result in what is called as hypercapnia so in type 2 respiratory failure they are characterized by having hypoxia and as well as the hypocapnia so this will be the arterial blood gas analysis which you will be seeing in type 2 respiratory failure right so in type 2 respiratory failure the other point is as i have said you there is hypoventilation but what hypoventilation is this it is your alveolar hypoventilation right it is your alveolar hypoventilation and because of the alveolar hypoventilation but you should know now why there is alveolar hypoventilation the reasons for the alveolar hypoventilation is number 1 i mean i will i'm telling i'm trying to tell you the mechanisms number 1 impairment of the central nervous system right impairment of the cns drive to breathe right now if the cns is under suppressed state because it is the you take the respiratory centers they are present in the medulla oblongata that is dorsal respiratory group and ventral respiratory group and you take in the pons that is pneumothoracic center and as well as apneustic center when these centers are under suppressed state what are the reasons for the cns suppression that is the next question 
But if there is impairment of the CNS drive, then the respiratory muscles will not get activated and the alveoli will go into alveolar hypoventilation. That is one reason. Next. The second reason why they can have the alveolar hypoventilation is, it is because of, right, it is because of impaired strength with failure of neuromuscular function. Remember, you take the phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve, which is having the root value from C3 to C5, should go to the diaphragm. And you take the intercostal nerves. They should go to the intercostal muscles and they should be stimulating the muscles and wherein the individual will have respiration. Now, if there is impairment of strength due to failure of the neuromuscular function, like for example, you take in patients with the myasthenia gravis, right? there is failure of the neuromuscular transmission and that is the reason why the subsequently the muscle is not getting activated there. So that is another reason why they can have alveolar hypoventilation. Next, third one, why they can have alveolar hypoventilation is due to increased load on the respiratory system, right, due to increased load on the respiratory system. Now, what I will do now is, I will take up the individual etiology, that is impairment of the CNS drive. Now, I will tell you in which all conditions you will have the impairment of the CNS drive and all those etiologies will lead to what is called as type 2 respiratory failure. So, first let me take up where you have, right, where you have diminished CNS drive. Remember, the diminished CNS drive you will see in case of the drug overdose, right, you will see this in case of the drug overdose. Now you take this particular drug overdose, like for example, you take the opioids, opioids what they will do, they will cause the respiratory center suppression, that is the CNS suppression will be there and thereby the respiratory centers are not under active state and thereby there is no alveolar ventilation. Alright, so once there is respiratory center suppression, there is no activity or there is no stimulus for the respiratory muscles and that lead to alveolar hypoventilation resulting in type 2 respiratory failure. Next, now where are the respiratory centers? The respiratory centers are present within the brainstem. If there is any brainstem injury, right, if there is any brainstem injury, that is another reason, right, that is another reason where the individual will have suppressed CNS drive. Next, the other condition is sleep disordered breathing. Right, sleep disordered breathing. For example, you take in patients with obstructive sleep apnea, right? In patients with the obstructive sleep apnea, because of the obstruction, that is because of the collapse of the pharyngeal muscles, there will be obstruction to the respiration and that is the reason why the individual will end up in hy will hypercapnia and hypoxia and that will lead to type 2 respiratory failure, right? Next, the other clinical condition is you take in case of hypothyroidism. Remember, what is the role of Right, what is the role of thyroid hormone on the respiratory centers is, remember thyroid hormone is very much required for the stimulation of the respiratory centers. If thyroid hormone is not there, there is no stimulation of the respiratory centers and that will lead to alveolar hypoventilation. So, these are all the conditions where you have reduced CNS drive. Next, let me take up the second one, that is impaired strength with failure of the neuromuscular function. Now, which all the conditions where you have impaired strength or reduced strength due to impaired neuromuscular transmission is, so you take the second category. Now, I am trying to tell you the conditions which will lead to that second category, that is impaired strength that can lead to, imp due to impaired neuromuscular transmission. Number one, as I have said you, an autoimmune disorder that is myasthenia gravis, right, autoimmune condition that is myasthenia gravis 
See, in patients with the myasthenia gravis, what is happening is there is antibody formation against the acetylcholine receptor and thereby the transmission from the presynaptic nerve terminal to the postsynaptic nerve terminal does not occur. And thereby what will happen that will lead to impairment of the neuromuscular transmission and that will lead to alveolar hypoventilation and that will lead to hypercapnia resulting in type 2 respiratory failure. Next, the other clinical condition where you have impairment of the neuromuscular transmission is in case of the Guillain-Barre syndrome. See, in Guillain-Barre syndrome, it is one of the demyelinating disorder. So, what will happen is, there will be demyelination of your intercostal nerves and as well as the phrenic nerve. So, once there is demyelination of this particular nerves, the transmission from the presynaptic nerve terminal to the postsynaptic nerve terminal which are present on the muscles will not occur and that results in the impairment of the neuromuscular transmission leading to alveolar hypoventilation. You take in patients with a motor neuron disease. Now, you take a motor neuron disease where you have involvement of lower motor neuron and as well as the upper motor neuron. So, what is that? That is your amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. In amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, the, because of the degeneration of the motor neurons, there will be impairment of the neuromuscular transmission. Next, the other clinical condition is wherever there is a phrenic nerve injury, right, wherever there is a phrenic nerve injury. So, phrenic nerve injury can happen in multiple conditions, but remember wherever there is phrenic nerve injury, there will be impairment of the neuromuscular transmission and that lead to what is called as the alveolar hypoventilation and causing type 2 respiratory failure. Next, now the other clinical conditions where the individual can have the alveolar hypoventilation is the conditions where you come across respiratory muscle weakness. Right, where you have respiratory muscle weakness. So, respiratory muscle weakness you will see in patients with the myopathy. Right, you will see in patients with the myopathy. For example, you take the congenital muscular dystrophies like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or Becker's dystrophy, there is degeneration of the muscles, thereby the muscles they does not ha have the activity of uh, doing alveolar ventilation and that leads to alveolar hypoventilation. Next, next to the myopathy, you take some of the electrolyte derangements. So, if you see the electrolyte derangements, you take in clinical conditions like hypokalemia. Potassium is very much required for the action potential of the muscle and if the individual is having hypokalemia, that will lead to what is called as the impairment of the action potential and the muscle does not get activated and that leads to alveolar hypoventilation. Next, in clinical conditions where the individual is excessively fatigued, there is respiratory muscle weakness leading to alveolar hypoventilation. So, remember in all these conditions, you have the alveolar hypoventilation and due to which the individual is landing up in type 2 respiratory failure. So, Apart from these causes, we have some more etiologies where you come across this type 2 respiratory failure, right? The other etiologies include like you take the transverse myelitis. So, even in patients with the transverse myelitis, there will be respiratory muscle impairment or there will be uh, the individual will be having alveolar hypoventilation. Next, you take in patients with the polio. Right. Next, you take in those children who are being affected with botulinum toxin where they have botulism, they can have respiratory muscle weakness or you take the cervical vertebra fracture that is C3 to C5 fracture. What will happen when this occurs? When this occurs, the root value for the phrenic nerve is gone. The individual will have phrenic nerve palsy resulting in diaphragmatic paralysis. Now, the other clinical conditions where you come across the type 2 respiratory failure is. Now, you see the reason for the type 2 respiratory failure is either alveolar hypoventilation that will lead to increase in the carbon dioxide levels in the body or the other reasons how the individual can have the hypoventilation resulting in building up of the carbon dioxide is if there is any obstruction within the respiratory tract. When there is an obstruction in the respiratory tract, then the air cannot move outwards that leads to hypoventilation and hypercapnia.
right? So that conditions include like chronic bronchitis. See, in case of chronic bronchitis, remember chronic bronchitis, it is a type of an obstructive lung disease. In chronic bronchitis, there is the inflammation of the airways. Due to the inflammation of the airways, the air which is present in the lung is unable to move out. That results in the hypoventilation and hypercapnia. Next, you take in patients with a tension pneumothorax. Right, you take in patients with a tension pneumothorax. A point what you should understand here is, you take the spontaneous pneumothorax, it will cause type 1 respiratory failure. It is not very dangerous. Whereas in case of tension pneumothorax, the pleura, it is containing a very high positive pressure and that will cause the collapse of the lung and that will cause the obstruction of the airways and that will lead to the hypercapnia, right? So tension pneumothorax and the acute severe asthma, that is nothing but your status asthmaticus. So in here, we, this particular terminology is not being used nowadays. So status asthmaticus. So even in case of status asthmaticus, what you have is type 2 respiratory failure. See, in case of bronchial asthma or you take in case of mild or moderate bronchial asthma, the individual will have type 1 respiratory failure. Whereas in case of status asthmaticus, they have type 2 respiratory failure. Next, the other thing is the presence of foreign body in the glottis. Right, the presence of the foreign body in the glottis. In this clinical condition also, that will there is a, there is an obstruction to the uh, respiratory airways or respiratory tract and that will lead to hypercapnia causing type 2 respiratory failure. Next, you take in patients with the obstructive sleep apnea already we have discussed and the other one is we have an important syndrome which is called as Pickwickian syndrome. Right, Pickwickian syndrome. So these are all the conditions where you come across the type 2 respiratory failure, right? Now, we will go back to our question like what we have discussed. False statement about type 1 respiratory failure. Now, you, you see here, decrease PaO2 in type 1. Is it correct or not? Yes, it is correct. You take PaCO2, right? PaCO2, remember, either it may be normal or it may be decreased. Right, because in patients with a type 1 respiratory failure, there is hyperventilation. Because of hyperventilation, what will happen? There will be either carbon dioxide washout. If the hyperventilation is minimal, the carbon dioxide levels may remain normal. But the point what you should understand is the AA gradient. That is called as alveolo arteriolar gradient. Right? Now, for example, you consider this is the alveoli. And you imagine this is the capillary, pulmonary capillary. Now, in type 1 respiratory failure, what is happening? The entire, there is alveolar flooding. Either it would be ARDS or it would be pneumonia, anything. There is alveolar flooding. So, once there is an alveolar flooding, do you think that there is adequate amount of oxygen in the alveolus? No. Right? And you take in the pulmonary capillary. The carbon dioxide levels are very high because uh, from the pulmonary artery, the blood comes to the pulmonary capillary and it is ready for the exchange with the alveolus. Right? So, but what is happening to the gradient, the alveolo arteriolar gradient is very much increased. How? You see, the carbon dioxide levels are very high, right? And because of the alveolar flooding, the, because of the alveolar flooding and that too because of the hyperventilation, the carbon dioxide washout will occur. Right, because the carbon dioxide is under very high pressure in the pulmonary capillary. So, that can enter into the alveolar and that will be washed out. But the problem is, because the alveoli are completely flooded with fluid, now where is the question of the oxygen coming enter into, entering into the alveolus? If the oxygen cannot enter into the alveolus adequately or only minimal amount of the oxygen has entered, that is not sufficient for the exchange with the pulmonary capillary. So, that will lead to increase in the alveolo arteriolar gradient right alveolo arteriolar gradient is not normal in these patients with the type 1 respiratory failure it is increased in patients with the type 1 respiratory failure next you see one more question on type 2 respiratory failure so if you see this question on type 2 respiratory failure in type 2 respiratory failure there is low po2 and low pco2 low po2 high pco2 so this is what you see right this is a direct question right whereas Normal PO2, high PCO2, this is not correct because PO2 is reduced and low PO2 and normal PCO2, this is also incorrect. So, the correct statement is the second option. Now, 
after having discussed about the type 2 respiratory failure treatment part i'll discuss all of them in the last after having discussed about the type 2 respiratory failure let me discuss about the type 3 and as well as type 4 respiratory failure so now let me discuss about type 3 respiratory failure so if you type take 3 type respiratory failure this is also called as perioperative respiratory failure and what will happen in these individuals in this form of respiratory failure this occurs as a result of lung atelectasis right this will result because of the lung atelectasis in the perioperative period and that too which particular part of the lung is affected in this it is bilateral basal zones they undergo atelectasis in these patients with a type 3 respiratory failure and how do you treat this particular type 3 respiratory failure is now these individuals the alveoli which have been collapsed in the base of the lung they have to get open or they need to get activated or they have to attain the normal position so first what you do is instead of making the individual to lie in one particular position the individual should frequently change the position right and the other thing which helps to the individual to come out of the atelectasis is by doing right by doing the chest physiotherapy and the other thing is you need to give or you need to put the patient on non invasive ventilator non invasive ventilator may also be used to reverse the regional atelectasis right this particular regional atelectasis will be reversed by your non invasive ventilator right so this is an important point that you should remember next now let me discuss the type 4 respiratory failure so what exactly is your type 4 respiratory failure is remember an important point here like we have the respiratory muscles which are very important for the respiration of the individual that is you take diaphragm and as well as intercostal in, external intercostal muscles for inspiration and even though you take expiration is a passive pro process which will where there will be an elastic recoil but whenever there is a forced expiration you require internal intercostal muscles and accessory muscles like abdominal muscles now these particular muscles they should have an adequate blood supply now you take in a normal individual right you take in a normal individual the respiratory muscles they consume almost less than 5% of the total cardiac output right less than 5% of the total cardiac output and through this particular cardiac output there will be oxygen delivery to the muscles right there will be oxygen delivery to the muscles now any clinical conditions which will cause decrease in the cardiac output this will lead to hypoperfusion right this will lead to hypoperfusion of the respiratory muscles and because of the hypoperfusion of the respiratory muscles what will happen is these respiratory muscles they become fatigued and thereby the individual will end up in what is called as respiratory failure so in those individuals whoever is in a state of shock cardiogenic shock or hypovolemic shock or hemorrhagic shock the respiratory muscles they don't receive adequate amount of the blood supply and the individual will land up in what is called as a type 4 respiratory failure now now there is no oxygen supply to the muscles now these muscles they undergo anaerobic metabolism rather than aerobic metabolism and because of which there is accumulation of the lactic acid so there will be lactic acidosis right there will be lactic acidosis now in these patients you should not try to do the experiments with non invasive ventilator because 
the oxygen supply to the muscles itself is less. The muscles have been completely fatigued, right? And the muscle is also having lactic acidosis. So in such clinical scenario, you need to directly intubate the patient, right? Intubation and as well as mechanical ventilation. This will allow the redistribution of the cardiac output. Right, this will allow the redistribution of the cardiac output and the perfusion to the respiratory muscles becomes normal. Right, becomes normal. So, this is what in case of type 4 respiratory failure. Now, what I will do is I will just compare all the types of respiratory failure and meanwhile I will also tell you the treatment of type 1 and as well as type 2 respiratory failure as well. So now let me compare all the types of respiratory failure. So you have type 1, type 2, type 3 and as well as type 4 respiratory failure. Now you take the type 1 respiratory failure. You can come across in spontaneous pneumothorax, you can come across in acute asthma or you can come across in patients with the ARDS or you can come across in patients with the pneumonia as well. Okay, so we will take up the ARDS. Right, we will take up the ARDS as a prototype. You take type 2 respiratory failure. We have discussed many etiologies, right? We have discussed many etiologies. Now, uh, out of which, let me take up the myasthenia gravis. And type 3 is what? Postoperative atelectasis. Type 4, it is due to decreased perfusion to the respiratory muscles. Right, decreased perfusion to the respiratory muscles. Now, the question is how do you treat? Now, you take in patients with the type 1 respiratory failure. They are suffering from very severe hypoxemia. That is why it is also called acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. So, you have to give a low volume ventilation. Right, low volume ventilation. This is a very, very important point. And you take in case of type 2 respiratory failure. You keep the first try and try and treat the patients with the NIV non-invasive ventilator. But with non-invasive ventilator, if the individual respiratory failure is unable to get corrected, and even in spite of NIV, if the patient's PCO2 is increased of more than 60 millimeters of mercury, that is the clinical condition where the individual requires the endotracheal tube. Along with that, intermittent positive pressure ventilation. Right? Along with that, you need to give intermittent positive pressure ventilation. That is if the NIV is not working and if the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide is more than 60 millimeters of mercury. Now, in case of post-operative atelectasis, already I have discussed. Like what we have seen in case of post-operative atelectasis, one is the frequent change in the position of the individual. Next is the chest physiotherapy. And next is the NIV. And if required, the patient will be requiring the ventilator. Right? Whereas in type 4 respiratory failure, you should not experiment with NIV. Directly, the patient will be requiring mechanical ventilator because the muscles, they are suffering from hypoxia and lactic acidosis. So, this completes the discussion on the types of respiratory failure.